Hey everybody, I hope you are doing well. And here I am with another lovely guest. This time it is Carl Jones, directly from the UK. Welcome, Carly. It's a pleasure to have you. Nice to meet you. Lovely to be here. Well, to give you a little insight about Carl, he is a conservationist from the UK, but has worked since the 1970s in Mauritius, a small island country in Africa. For those who don't know, Mauritius is very rich in endemic fauna, like many islands around the world, and sadly, most people just remember it because of the Dodo story. And sadly, this species got extinct, but this inspired conservationists like Carl to keep fighting for the other endemic species, such as the Mauritius kestrel and the pink pigeon. So what? Let's start, Carl. What can you tell us uh, about you, about how you got inspired to, to work in Mauritius and to, to save a species? Thank you very much. Well, like many people, I've always been interested in wildlife. And when I was a young boy, I watched birds and I watched mammals. And I was just very interested in nature. And I used to look after sick and injured animals. And in my garden, I kept in cages all sorts of different animals that I was nursing back to health. Or in some cases, they were pet animals. And I was fascinated by falcons. And I had some European kestrels, some common kestrels. And I kept them in my back garden and they bred and I produced some young birds. And I thought to myself, wow, if you can breed this species in captivity, I'm sure you can breed some of the rare ones. And I'd heard about the Mauritius kestrel and I heard that it was critically endangered and was likely to become extinct. And I thought to myself, I can save that. And so the long story is that I went to America and I met people involved and so on. But eventually I actually got offered the job to go to Mauritius to work on the Mauritius Kestrel. In those days, there were very few left. And in fact, they were having so many problems with them that the international funding organizations said, we want you to go to Mauritius for one, perhaps two years, and then step back and hand it over to the locals and they can look after the Mauritius Kestrel. But the problem was that there was no skills on Mauritius for doing that. And so essentially, some of the overseas organizations were stepping back and I think the Mauritius Kestrel would have become extinct but I was very lucky that I was able to get funding and help from a number of organizations including the Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust that I work for, the Jersey's do, and also from the Peregrine Fund in America and for a number of years they funded the work on the Mauritius Kestrel and I stayed in Mauritius for 20 years and uh, 40 years later, I'm still going back to Mauritius once, twice a year to work on the Mauritius kestrel, but also to work on all the other endangered species there. You know, when you work on one species, all you're doing is restoring one small part of the system. And of course, in Mauritius, I started with kestrels. Then I moved on to pink pigeons and echo parakeets and Mauritius fodies and a whole host of species. And we've been successful in saving nine species of vertebrates that without our help are likely to have become extinct. So we've, we've done very well. And there's a lot of other species we've saved as well. And what's really interesting is when you work on endangered species, it can help drive the restoration of their habitats and their ecosystems. So that very briefly is outlining some of the work that I've done 
working with some of the rare birds, but we've also been successful in restoring a species called the Rodrigues fruit bug, and also in restoring several reptiles, including the round island boa, the kelpie skink, the orange tail skink, and so on. So a whole host of reptiles, but also rebuilding island ecosystems and helping to save some of the rare plants there. So rebuilding a whole community. And that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in saving species, but also using those species to drive that bigger agenda of restoring whole systems. Well, and I think, I think we have the ability to save, well, I don't think I know, we have the ability to save most of the endangered species in this world if we really want to and apply ourselves to it. And, you know, that's one of the reasons I'm giving this interview today is because I want to encourage other people like yourself to get out there and to help save some of the critically endangered species because all species are savable and we shouldn't be pushed down by all this doom and gloom to think about what we can achieve. Exactly. And for most part, sometimes I believe that, for example, I, you told two interesting topics there. The first one, that the NGOs need to focus on the livelihoods of the local people too. I mean, like, for example, if this country has local conservationists that are trying to do everything possible to protect native species, why don't you, like, help them being an overseas NGO? And then that way you will have both local and uh, and overseas, but conservationists. So yeah, the topic you said about Mauritius is a reality in many other countries in which practically, let's just say it like, they don't have conservationists, local conservationists in one species. So, you know, like to train them, to help them, to encourage them to continue. Also, oh yeah. No, carry on, carry on. Oh, okay. Well, the second thing that I'm very interested on is that helping a species, you only restore or help one small part of the ecosystem. But in some cases, like Mauritius, which is an island, you need to restore the entire ecosystem by helping all and a good array of species. Some wonderful, wonderful points there. And, you know, I agree with all the sentiments you're putting forward. And I did say that I went to Mauritius and I was there for 20 years. And then I came back to Britain, but I still go out there. But the reason I was able to come back to Britain was because, although I love Mauritius and I couldn't stay there forever, um, there were young Mauritians ready to step into my shoes. So I stepped back, let other people take over. And we have in fact developed on Mauritius, our own NGO, the Mauritian Foundation. And they are now running conservation programs there and doing a wonderful job. And I've moved back to Wales. And although I go out to Mauritius twice a year and I help and advise and so on. I'm also now involved with a whole host of other species worldwide, advising on endangered species programs. And that's one of my great joys in life is to actually help nurture uh, young people to look after their own wildlife resources. And of course, that's exactly what we should be doing. But of course, the other thing you mentioned or the other issue is do you actually save individual species or do you put your money into restoring whole systems well that's an interesting question and it is one that conservationists have battled over for many many years where do we actually put our resources do we put money into saving the Mauritius kestrel or do we put money into saving the forest in which the Mauritius kestrel is found? 
But what is really interesting is we start with a species, the kestrel, and over time it grows into working with other species, but also in restoring the habitat. So I think that species are the key to understanding how systems work, and then they help drive the restoration of a whole ecosystem. Yes, yes, and, and indeed, it is a reality that other NGOs should be doing too, because I know of cases in Latin America, in other parts of Asia, Africa, that for example, they don't like, you know, they don't work with the local people or they don't, they don't want that. It's very nice to hear that you get, got back to the UK. Okay, you already got there, but because the own Mauritian, the own Mauritian conservationists, young conservationists are doing their part too. And, and that's lovely to hear, yeah. Also, regarding what you said about the restoration, uh, for example, the white seahorse, when I had that interview, the white seahorse are like a species that can determine the health of the ecosystem. Why? Because when you see them, it means that there are food sources, the water pollution isn't too high. But what I mean in here is that that could be the case of the Mauritius kestrel because you started working on them. And when you saw that their numbers were, you know, somewhat stable or increasing, all the environment started to change. Then the other endangered species were, you know, like you started to help them. So they could also do their part. And, and wow, it's, it's an in incredible feat indeed. And, and in what time, I mean, like 20 in 30 years, right? You have achieved all of these with this array of species. Um, I've been working in Mauritius now for over 40 years. And what's really quite fascinating about it is that the work starts off very slowly. And for the first few years, we had very few successes. And in fact, lots of things went wrong. It was very difficult to get the kestrels to live in captivity and breed in captivity. And then we had to find out about them and put them back in the wild. So it took a long while. But once we'd actually established how to do it, the population started to recover. But what's interesting is that it's taken decades to restore the kestrel, the pigeon and the parrot. And when I look at other programs worldwide, I see the same pattern, that it can take decades to restore a species, although it need not necessarily be particularly difficult, it just takes time. And I think that one of the problems that we have is that people want to achieve a lot in a hurry. You can achieve a lot, but it just takes time. And I think that if you actually pace yourself and that if you have a long-term vision, you can achieve a huge amount. So the work on the Mauritius Kestrel has resulted in us saving at least nine species of vertebrates from extinction, restoring several islands, offshore islands around Mauritius, setting up a national park, and also setting up lots of protected areas. So we've achieved a huge amount, but it took a long time to develop the momentum to get that going. And I think that one of the main problems we have in conservation is that people only think about three or five years. They're not thinking in terms of decades. So, you know, I went to Mauritius and I was very lucky that I loved the island and I loved the people and I loved the animals and I didn't want to leave. And I wanted to make sure I'd stay there, that I was going to stay there until I'd saved the species. And so I kept going year in, year out. And we were successful. And I think you can do that in lots of places, but you're not going to do it in three or five years. It's going to take you 10, 20, 30, 40 years to restore some of these species, if not longer. So to restore species and ecosystems, you need to plan long-term, not a small-term, like you said. So then, 
now that, that you have, well, for me, you're an inspiration because all what you have achieved, okay, probably for many conservationists or for many people, they are like, I will not spend four years of my life doing something. But for me, that's the essence of your work. And that's how inspiring this was for, for me and for other people. So regarding the, the restoration programs in the islands, how were they affected by the oil spill in Mauritius earlier this year? Like, I mean, how does this affect the conservation of the several species you're working on? Probably some of the birds weren't that affected, but the reptiles, the, yeah, they, how, how are they faring after well, this? Well, that's a wonderful question and lots of people have asked me. I have to admit that I wasn't there at the time because I was here in Britain and we were under lockdown. So I couldn't go to Mauritius, but my colleagues got in touch with me and we discussed it. And what was really interesting was that the, the ship um, grounded on the reef just next to one of our nature reserves, a nature reserve called Ile Zagret. And so the whole island which is only, it's only a small island, about 25 hectares, but we have lots of precious things on it. The whole island was engulfed all the way around with oil. And my colleagues phoned me up and I spoke to them on, on Zoom and they said, tell me, what are we going to do? And so we took some of the birds off and we put them in a captive breeding center that we run. And we took some of the plants from the nursery but I said, I think most will be okay if we leave them be and keep an eye on them and make sure that the birds have got plenty of food and water. And that's exactly what happened, is that they've survived very, very well. Yes, there was a terrible mess around the coast of Mauritius, but a lot of that was cleaned up by the locals. I don't know what impact the oil spill has had on the reef or the, the lagoon, but I suspect that it will bounce back because these systems tend to be quite resilient to oil spills. So yes, it looked awful and it did cause us lots of problems. And yes, we still got problems in that there is oil on the rocks all the way around the island, but most of the species have come through it with no problem at all. So that's good. Although I must admit, we were all very, very stressed at the time. But yes, it's, it, there, isn't an, there isn't a happy ending. Of course there isn't a happy ending, but we didn't lose. As far as I'm aware, we've lost very few birds and reptiles, if any. Well, that's, that's nice to hear actually. And yeah, seeing all their oil spills and the impact, the severe impact they had, well, this is very good to hear. So you mentioned uh, that also another conservation success in Mauritius was the Rodriguez fruit bat. I've been very interested in it because Mauritius has two endemic bat species, the Mauritius and the Rodriguez fruit bat. So, what can you tell me about the Rodriguez fruit bat? What are the threats? How how you how you breed them or protect them in Mauritius so they can now have a population of about five thousand individuals? Okay, that's a very good question. Actually, the Rodriguez fruit bat is found not on the island of Mauritius, but is found on a small Rodriguez. island which belongs to Mauritius called Rodriguez. And when we started working on the Rodriguez fruit bat in the 1970s, the population was very low. And in fact, it is thought that in the early to mid 1970s, it may have gone down to as low as perhaps 20 to 30 individuals, so very small population. And the reason for that was because Rodriguez had been poorly managed, not by the Rodriguez, but by overseas experts saying, well, Rodriguez has got to become self-sufficient in agriculture. They need to chop down the forest. They need to 
you know, lev level a lot of areas, create agricultural land, and in doing that, they destroyed the watersheds. And so for a number of years, Rodrigues had very little forest, and the, it was a very barren island. But in the 1970s, <laughs> late 1970s, people began to realize that they actually needed to keep the forest. So in the early 80s, we started to replant forest on Rodrigues. And yes, they were replanting with commercial trees, but also we said, you've got to put back native trees. So we started reforesting the island with native plants. And this work was, although I was involved in it, only as an advisor, most of the work was done by young Rodriguez, people your age, who went out and planted trees on the hills and oh. setting up small nature reserves. And the plants grew very well. And slowly, the Rodriguez fruit bats started to increase in number. And of course, once they had forest, it was preserving the watershed so that they had more water throughout the year and, and less erosion. And uh, so the vegetation has started to come back and the population of bats has grown. And it's grown and it's grown so that now we have not 5,000, not 10,000, but we have, perhaps we have as many as 20,000 Rodrigues fruit bats. And this is on a tiny island. You know, the island is wow. only um, eight miles by five miles. It's 42 square miles in all. And we have all these bats there. And they're doing very, very well. So, so it's gone from so a very rare bat to now being a very common bat on the island. And what's really interesting is that as the forest has come back, so have two other very rare birds. There was a rare bird called the Rodrigues Fodi that was once thought to be extinct. Uh, sorry, the Rodrigues Warbler that was once thought to be extinct. And also the Rodrigues Fodi, which is a small little weaver bird um, which declined in the late 1960s to a population of only 12 known individuals. So that's come back and we now have about 15 to 20,000 of both of those birds on the island. So they've recovered and also a lot of, a lot of the plants have recovered. There was one plant there called uh, the, the Rodrigues hibiscus it's called Hibiscus lilyflorus. And that declined to two known individuals in the wild. And we've, I'm not sure how many we've got, but we were able to grow them in nurseries and to plant out somewhere around 3,000 individuals. So we have, let's say we have hundreds, if not low thousands of those plants. So we saved that plant as well. So we saved lots of plants. And of course, we've saved those species that I mentioned. But also, by putting back the forest and leaving the forest grow and flourish, we assume, and there's some evidence, that a lot of the insects and other invertebrates have also recovered. So it's a really wonderful example of how species work, working with the Rodrigues fruit bat, drove the restoration of putting back the forest and has saved all these other species. I, I am simply without words. Really, this is, this is a story that, that I hope many people see this video and hear it because you know how only like you said, only helping one species, the Rodriguez fruit bat, and of course, restoring the forest also help the other species, plus the native plants, plus invertebrates. So, wow, I I'm simply, you know, without words. But I've got to tell you that the story in Rodriguez is a story of the restoration by the local people, because Yes, I was involved and 
international organizations were involved, but it was driven by the young people of Rodrigues who said, we've got to save our wildlife. The Rodrigues fruit bat belongs to us. And there was one young man who helped with this work, a gentleman called Richard Payendi. And when he started working with us, he was a very young man. And he is now a senior minister running the island. So he's in charge of agriculture and tourism. And of course he is making sure that they look after the island. And this man started off as, well, he was only in his early twenties when he started working with us as a volunteer. And he brought together lots of young people in Rodrigues and he drove this work. So uh, you're talking about how I was involved in restoring the Roderick fruit bat. We should really be saying it was Richard. Richard Payendi was the one that really drove it. And I was a bit of a catalyst, if you like. I sort of helped impressive. direct something. Very, very it impressive. It was the locals that did it, not me, it was the locals. So yeah, I think there's a good story there and it just shows what we can do. And I think one of the big lessons I've learned in my life is that individuals can make a difference. It isn't organizations that save endangered species. Yes, it's organizations. You might work for those organizations. They might provide the funding, but it is individuals within those organizations that have the drive. They want to make a difference and they go out and they do it. So all the great things in conservation happen because of individual people. And that's what we should be telling people is that when we really want to, we can make a difference. Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's practically the purpose of this video, to encourage people to do the change if they can what i mean like if for example in your garden you have several species of animals that benefit from from a big tree a big fruit tree why will you cut it because that's the home of an animal and that brings biodiversity and probably for many people they it isn't that they don't care but probably they don't know if that species okay what are the threats and that kind of stuff but they, they have to be, you know, to do the change, just to try to do as little as they can and as much as they can too. So, well, uh, going back to the topic of Richard, it's, it's very impressive that a local individual did all of that, you know, like to safeguard his island, his island's wildlife. And regarding what you said about tourism, is tourism a threat to Mauritian wildlife? Like, I mean, I know that Mauritius is very touristic. Many people come from Asia and from Europe to visit the beaches and the landmarks in Port Louis. So, well, does this affect indirectly or directly some of the most iconic Mauritian species? That's a, a very interesting question. And of course, it's something that a lot of people think about all the time. Ecotourism, I think, can actually be a huge advantage. And one of the things we've been trying to encourage the Mauritius government to do is when it's advertising Mauritius, to talk about the things that make Mauritius so special. And Mauritius is special because of its culture and its scenery, but also because there are species found nowhere else in the world. And I keep saying, well, yeah, Mauritius is famous for the dodo, but do you really want to be associated with something that's disappeared forever? Mauritius can also be famous for the pink pigeon, for the Mauritius kestrel, for all the other very special species. And increasingly over the years, we have seen that the wildlife 
of Mauritius is being used more and more in its marketing. And one of our nature reserves, Ile Zegret, which is the one I told you got inundated by the oil, that is open to tourists. And so tourists can go to Mauritius and they can go across in a boat and they can visit this island and they can see the forest there and they can see some of the birds and the reptiles and the giant tortoises. So yes, tourism can do a lot of damage, but it can also do a lot of good. And we have been trying to embrace tourism for good. And of course, tourism is very important for Mauritius because people come from all over the world just to go and enjoy the island. I'm not sure what's going to happen now with COVID worldwide because the tourist industry has been closed down in Mauritius for the time being. Yeah. But if it does yeah. recover, let's hope that we can harness tourism for the good of the island. And, you know, I think we've got to be thinking positive about these things rather than seeing the problems. Think about how we can turn those into something more beneficial to the wildlife. And if the tourists want to see the wildlife, of course, people are going to look after it because it's got value. Exactly. That's what I meant. For example, many people know Mauritius is because of the dodo. And the dodo left this world hundreds of years ago. So yes. why don't you focus on the really interesting that are still alive and that are conservation success story species? Like, for example, the Mauritius Kestrel, the egg parakeet. Okay, I have heard of the egg parakeet before, but I didn't even knew they were native to Mauritius. I thought they were, I don't know, Australian, that there's a species that is very similar. I believe it is the orange fronted kakariki or something like that. I believe that's why, that's where the confusion comes. But regarding the echo parakeet, I, I really like parrots, you know, they are social, they are interesting. They are a bird genus that has many things to discover and is very interesting. So as the echo parakeet is a native and the only native parrot species of Mauritius, what can you tell us about it? Like, what are its threats? How does conservation have saved it from extinction? And well, how does it, how does it is unique? What a nice question. Mauritius was once famous, well, it's famous for the dodo because it's gone, but it's also lost a lot of parrot species as well. At roughly around the same time that the dodo became extinct, there was a very large, poorly flighted bird called the raven parrot, which was also found in Mauritius, which disappeared. And if you read the early accounts, they talk about lots of multicolored parrots on the island. We're not sure exactly how many species, but perhaps four or five species of parrots were found on Mauritius. And if you look at the other islands like Rodrigues and Reunion, they also had their own species of parrots. So in all those islands in the Indian Ocean, there were many species of parrots, most of which have gone, disappeared. But on Mauritius, we just have this one species left, the echo parakeet. And you're quite right, it does look like some other species of parakeets. In fact, there's a parakeet in India that looks very much like it, the rose-ringed parakeet. <laughs> but unfortunately with the echo parakeet, is it lives in the native forest and there's not much forest left. And so the population went very low due to habitat destruction. And unfortunately, within the remains of the native forest, there were very few big old trees in which you could nest. So there was a shortage of nest sites. And also, there were a number of species that compete with it, taking its food and so on. So when we started with the echo parakeet, the population was very low. We only knew of a dozen individuals and we only knew of about three, maybe four females. So a tiny, tiny population. And when those birds tried to breed, they nearly always failed 
because the nest sites were very poor quality. There was a problem with parasites that killed the babies. There wasn't enough food in the forest to feed the young. And so what we did was we started to work with the parrots. And when they produced young, we would take the young and hand rear them. And we established them in captivity and started to breed them. And we also, in the wild, started to restore areas of native forest, put up nest boxes, and we also tried feeding them because we realized that at certain times of the year there were food shortages. And over a period of half a dozen years or so we released 139 parrots which we had reared in captivity, either reared from young or eggs we'd taken from the wild or ones that had been bred in captivity, and we released those birds and we started to look after them by feeding them, by providing nest boxes, and they started to mingle with the, the few wild birds that were left and they started breeding. And today we have a population of parrots, echo parakeets, which is more than 700, perhaps as many as 800 birds. So this is a bird that we only had a dozen when we started with, and we now have maybe 800. So it's been very successful. However, because there are no, or very few large forest trees, we have to put up nest boxes for them, have to feed some of them. They don't all come in and take food, but some of them do. And those that come and take food, extra food, uh, they lay more eggs and they produce more young. So while we're trying to restore the forest and get the habitat back into shape, which of course it can take a very long while, we are looking after them. And we now have 800 birds flying around in Mauritius. So that's one of our very, very great successes. And if you look above my head on the wall behind me, you can see some pictures of parrots and those are... Yeah. The parakeets from the Indian Ocean Islands, including the echo parakeet. And there's another one here, which is the reunion parakeet. So these are the birds that I've been working with. And yes, very, very beautiful. And we've restored them. But you know what's really interesting, Fabrizio, is that, yes, we've saved the echo parakeet, but we've also learned how we can bring back these species by providing nest boxes, by harvesting young, by rearing them in captivity, by learning how to reintroduce them. So we are developing the techniques which we can now apply to other, can now apply to other species of parrots worldwide. And that's what I think is really important about Mauritius. It's an island that gave us the idea of extinction with a dodo. It's now an island which is showing us how to restore critically endangered population, and then use those species to drive the restoration of whole ecosystems. And that is a very powerful and positive message. So practically Mauritius uh, was like a field lab, you know, to, to prove all these techniques and to implement it worldwide. You know, I, I really liked one of your techniques, the one you used with the Mauritius Kestrel, second clutching, in which you took the first clutch to hand rear them, and then the, the parents, oh no, where are my eggs? So then they lay again, and that, and they hand raised them. So, you know, from four individuals and two clutches per, you, uh, there were two pairs, right? There, yeah, okay. two pairs at its lowest, yes. Wow. So then you took one of the clutches, hand reared them, and then the parents hand reared the other. No, it, I really like that technique. I don't know why, because you know, it is like, how, why do the parents lay a second clutch? Did they thought okay. that their, their eggs disappeared in, or, you know, I, I, it is very funny. I've been thinking that from yesterday, I really like the technique in the conservation matter. 
but that question came to mind. It, it, it's been applied many times before with other species and California condors, whooping cranes, a lot of species. People take the eggs and very often they will lay replacements. So double clutching, it doesn't work with all species, but it works with some species. And with the Mauritius kestrel, it works very well. That if you take the eggs very early on in the season, they will lay a second lot. We tried that technique with echo parakeets as well. And it worked okay, uh, but they didn't always relay. So it didn't work quite as well as it did with the Mauritius kestrel. But we also tried it with the pink pigeon. And pink pigeons will lay more eggs. Pink pigeons keep laying, 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 laying. So you can use these techniques on a whole range of species. But I must point out that we did have expert help. We had help from an organization in America called the Peregrine Fund. And they sent over some specialist people to help us hatch the eggs and rear the young. So yes, all these techniques are very beneficial or can be very, very good, but they uh, do need the help of experienced personnel. Yeah, definitely. And well, before we go, you, you talked about the pink pigeon and I believe that today, that's the animal we have talked about the, the less. I mean, like the pink pigeon is also very interesting because if I'm correctly, it is the, the only pigeon species on the island oh, apart from crab pigeon, right? That's correct. It's the only native one left. Native. Can we stop the recording a minute? I've got a visitor at the front door. Well, the pink pigeon was once the world's rarest pigeon. And in 1990, we only knew of nine or 10 individuals left in the wild. And the reason for that was because a lot of the forest had gone, that there were monkeys on the island that were introduced and they were taking the eggs of the pigeons. And essentially, they were finding it really tough to survive. But fortunately, we had a few individuals in captivity. And these had been collected in the early 1970s by Gerald Durrell, the writer, who has a zoo in Jersey. And so we had captive ones, and we were able to breed from those. They weren't very easy to breed because you put a male and a female together, and they wouldn't always like each other. So you had to swap them around to get compatible pairs. But we did learn how to breed them. And over several years, we bred hundreds of birds. And then we started to put them back into the wild. But what we did was when we put them into the wild, we fed them and we made sure that we put them into areas where there weren't monkeys that could take the eggs. And we controlled or removed some of the other pest species, such as cats and mongooses and the population has grown. So in 1990, we had nine or 10, and today we have between 350 and 400 birds. So it's doing very well. But it does need looking after, because Mauritius, the forest has been so destroyed, it's gonna take a long while for the forest to recover, if it does recover. It's going to take ages to get the forest back into a good shape. So in the meanwhile, we're going to have to look after the echo parakeet and the pink pigeon, feeding them, providing <laughs> nest boxes for the parrots, controlling some of these introduced species, such as the monkey's cat. And then eventually, hopefully, when the forest comes back, we can step back from looking after those species and they can become independent. Definitely a success story because, okay, you still need to look after them, but now you know that their numbers are not that low that in a, that in a flicker of the eyes, you will lose them, you know? So, 
Well, very good. The point I want to make is that a lot of people think that we can do conservation by putting animals in zoos and in captivity. And yes, we can do that. And of course, there are zoos worldwide that do wonderful work. But we can also take zoo techniques and apply them to wild <laughs> populations. And I, it's better to have them flying around in the wild where they are still interacting with other species, still fulfilling an ecological role and under natural selection. So they're still evolving. And that's better than having them stuck in cages. So I think that zoos have got a great deal to offer the world by the work that they do, but also by taking the techniques that we learn in zoos and applying them to free living and wild populations. Amazing, really amazing. And that's a topic that has been talked before about some species. Okay, probably you can both work it in situ and ex situ. But in some cases, I believe that there is no necess necessity. It, what, how do I explain myself? Like, for example, okay, probably this species is endangered. But we have the techniques, we have the facilities. We, we can start working right here with wild birds, with, you know, like not interfering with the environment instead of just taking like, well, let's take 20 birds and then send it to several zoos and they breed them and, you know, this is a very controversial topic. That's why I don't want to enter too much in it. No, of course. Uh but there zoos are, are wonderful. Oh, Zoo. Sorry, yeah, carry on. Not a problem. I was going to say that zoos are wonderful, but they're not the whole answer. And, you know, taking those techniques and applying them to free living populations has got to be the way forward, I think. And, you know, it works so well. But are there techniques that we need to learn about and to develop those techniques? And uh, then we can be highly successful. Exactly. That's that was what I was gonna say. That okay, there have been several examples about animals that were taken into captivity. But at the end, okay, you many should send the funding and send donations. But does that animals will ever be wild again? Or, or their offspring, I mean. But yeah, you know, this is very controversial. So before we go, just on Tuesday, I ended up reading I, I, and I, the book from Jerry Durrell. Oh, Jared I think Jerry Durrell, yes. And, and I was impressed and I, and I was like, oh my God, I'm interviewing Carl Jones and he was in a Gerald Durrell book. And I was like, oh my God, you know, like very, thoughtful about it and how does Gerard Durrell was an inspiration to you? What could you say about it? H how, what does it meant for you to keep doing this work to it, the, sim the simple fact that you met him is simply lovely. Yeah, lovely because having the opportunity to meet such such uh, an interesting and expert. I have so many adjectives to describe Gerald Dorrell that I could go on for ages in here. So, Carl. Well, I, I worked with Gerald Dorrell for over 15 years, so I knew him very well. And Jerry Dorrell was famous because of his writing, but also because he recognized the importance of zoos. But he thought beyond that. And it was Jerry who was saying we should be applying all these zoo techniques to managing species in the wild. It was Jerry who set up the project in Mauritius. And, you know, he brought species into captivity, but he wanted to make sure they went back out into the wild again and to work with the local people to develop the conservation that we're doing. So what I am doing is I'm just following in his footsteps. He's been the greatest influence in my life. 
And all I've been doing is taking his, his ideas and developing them, taking them a step further. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Simply that. It's, it's so amazing that you have followed his steps and that you are doing this. Because, okay, for example, this is in Mauritius. It's an island. But, but I believe that this example could also be made in bigger places, in other ecosystems. It's just, the, just, just what you need is, one, a long-term plan. Second, a huge interest on doing a difference. And third, well, do the work, you know, like see what are the threats, what can you do to, to have the species work with the local people, and, and that's it. Actually, you know, I, I know conservation isn't easy because from, they think that conservation is easy, but it's very complex. But actually, I believe that if people help together, they, many other things could have been achieved and could and are going to be achieved. Because, okay, there are many endangered species, but we can do something. Just we need, that's it, to do it. Not, not just to stay there like, oh no, I'm gonna wait that somebody comes and does something and then and the next day the species is extinct and you can do anything. Yeah. Yep, you're right. And always remember, Fabrizio, all species are savable. You just have to go and do it. Well, Carl, before we go, can you tell our our viewers a uh, inspirational message about conservation? What does everything has meant to you? In what would you tell them to keep going, to encourage them to, well, to donate oh. to your cause, to the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation, and to help a species? Well, I think that we hear lots of bad news about habitat destruction, about species decline, about pandemics, and so on. But there's also a lot of good things happening in the world. We can save species, we can rebuild systems, and we can solve complex problems. But we just have to do it. So I think we need to be a lot more realistic and optimistic. Yes, it's, there's no point in being hugely optimistic if you can't do it. But if you think about what we can do and how we can do it one small step at a time, we can achieve a great deal. And every single one of us can make a real difference. But we've just got to go and do it. Excellent message and the sherry on the top of the cake to end this interview. Well, Carl, I would like to say thank you for accepting this opportunity. Thank you for your time. It is a pleasure for me to have you. You are a big inspiration for me and for all the young conservationists, the work you have done to save all of these species is amazing. I hope more people carry on in other countries, in other places, in Mauritius, to keep caring for them. And I wish you the best. Uh, thank you for being here with us. Thank you very much indeed. Well, people, here we are, we are going to end the interview, but before you can donate to the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation, Carl's uh, Foundation, they work with all the species we talked about today and they are doing an excellent work for conservation. Also, please subscribe and like my, my videos. I will give you down below the links to the donation page of Mauritian Wildlife Foundations, uh, their website, and if they have their social media. Thank you for being here, and more interviews coming soon. Remember, on, 28, on November 28th, there will be one coming up. There, there are several clues around there of what the animal will be, and if you can guess it, well, I will give you a shout out on my next interview.
Thank you again. Thank you, Carl, and well, see you Thank soon. You. Bye. Bye.